so the small disclaimer has to be about what do we mean by happiness um it's obviously not the transient pleasure that comes from my teacher's favorite example is cheesecake and since we all love it we all go with the cheesecake example saying that you know you have experiences of pleasure through the day but when we're looking at happiness need just to say we're looking at something perhaps a little bit deeper um and i feel the elements are actually not very complicated if we can have a um, slightly more authentic simpler life which allows us to say what we mean mean what we say where we're in some ways just in alignment with reality so for example let's take you now you and i have to speak today if we have to speak today that there will be things which allow for us to speak right like having a decent internet having some light having devices which work and so on there will also be some things which will prevent us from speaking so you know like the headphones which didn't work as well um and if you're able to flow and be with that the fact that so much of it actually works in our favor through the day the fact that we're able to get up that we've got our senses that we've got so many abilities that we've got things which work in our favor including being able to have this um if you're actually able to start seeing that it's not complicated to create the sense of happiness and fulfillment and perhaps ease hi nivedita welcome to the podcast thank you so much deepak very happy to be here and thank you for inviting me how have you been not too bad not too bad weather is good for now so it's all in good space so uh, before we move on to our topic uh, a quick intro from your side nivedita again we have heard it before but just a quick one who nivedita is and who what her journey has been journey is easier so I'll, i'll stick with that one i feel um, i started with a slightly more biomedical perspective on health disability wanting to help others and so on um from there i moved into a slightly more psychological social space saying it's not only physical health it's also how you think it's also how you understand the world how you understand yourself and so on um khair utna deep nahi tha nor did i have the vocabulary for it at that time um and now over the past maybe decade or so it's also moved towards a slightly more spiritual bent i've been a student of buddhist philosophy um and sweetly enough when i started studying buddhist philosophy you know you study what is called the four noble truths um and the first noble truth is actually um that of suffering in some way but when they break down this concept of suffering the first the first um, part of it is really called suffering of suffering which is birth aging illness death and in some ways i feel like the first phase of my training was largely there where the suffering is obvious right when you're ill let's say bukhar ho or if it's something more severe like let's say an accident um suffering becomes very visible the second kind is actually called suffering of change and most of us can understand it let's say uh, you don't get a promotion let's say there's a loss of something that you love i mean it could be a new car which gets crashed um and the third of course is a slightly more pervasive view of suffering or unease or unrest and i feel in some ways when i look at my training i would say it's kind of moved through all three stages and now i'm somewhere in the third one trying to make sense of it and see what can be done with it so yeah broadly there well very interesting and hopefully we'll we'll learn from all of your stages journey in this podcast uh the topic this time uh navita is is focused around this this concept of i and uh, i'm fairly sure by this who am i question i and you basically mean different things but let's try to Uh, resolve and uh, sort of untangle this concept before we move to that this question who am i uh, why is this relevant why should anybody even think about this who am i because we have never thought about it and life seems to go okay i mean ups and downs but it seems to go fine so why is this question even relevant so i think part of it is also in the second phase of your question right that life seems to go okay and i would i don't know question does it and i think for most of us to a large extent perhaps yes but for many of us not really um 
and even for those of us where let's say things are going reasonably well uh which you get some of the promotions you don't get the rest you do well in some things you don't get the rest um there's also a sense of unrest and chase and a certain kind of um tightness with which we are approaching all our goals the way we live um and i don't know if that's really optimal so in some ways um as we go about our day as we go about our life we have these targets milestones uh, whether they are social milestones like marriage kids job um or whether they are more internal milestones i feel we're also holding on to things in a certain way which perhaps um is not in alignment with the way the world is and in some ways if we simply believe that the world is out there and it just happens to us um so then we continuously chase things saying it's out there so i need to chase it but i don't know if that's really how it needs to be there can be a reflection of what is it that i bring to that chase to that interaction to any space and if i am perhaps able to examine that um maybe it becomes a little bit more fruitful otherwise the emphasis is so much sorry you were saying so is it a question of i mean how you phrased it life is okay and you would ask is it or mm-hmm. is it a question of it can be a bit better so i feel it can be a whole lot better <laughs> yeah but um i also feel that it is important to stop and examine how we do things kahi baar whether it's suffering or whether it's even just quality of life most of the time if i talk about quality of life we have ideas about how life should be i should have a b c d whether they are things whether they are people uh we then have further expectations about how the things should be so it's not enough to get water in the tap but the water needs to come at a certain temperature it's not enough to have a spouse or a partner but they need to behave in a certain way which makes sense to my world and all of this in some way creates um suffering at different levels and most of the time if you examine it um it feels like the external factor is what's causing the suffering but actually it's when the external factor whether it's the water from the tap or the spouse behaving in a certain way meets with my mind um which either has a certain expectation or is holding on to something really tightly uh that the experience of suffering or good life or bad life actually comes up so we may or may not be always in a position to control temperature of water in the tap or behavior of the partner but we can definitely examine the factors that we bring to the table so the who am i or what am i or basically just even shifting the lens inward to an exploration of this entity that we take for granted where the lens is so much on the out all the time um is i think a very very helpful space to be because then not only um can we take ownership of who we are how we see the world how we interpret the world how we react um but we can continue to work on ourselves to recognize so much of it is conditioning and baggage that we've collected over the years um we can't start to let it go because teachers have been kind enough to leave us a path to say you know if you do this you can drop some of your baggage and that becomes i think very very helpful hmm and how does one even start on this this kind of a journey i mean let's say you convince people that okay it's a relevant question what would the initial steps be then um so i feel the first and most important step is really building conviction um because in the absence of that conviction we can also just end up just i don't know for lack of a better word just doing a lot of shopping saying i need to look within but i don't know what i need to do so one is i think building conviction for self saying that yeah of course there is a certain amount of i that i bring into any interaction um the second part i feel is you know we're also very very fortunate to be living in a day and age where um everything is a click of a button away like just now you and i are speaking across countries but literally you click a few buttons and except for downloads and updates and other issues there we are having this conversation immediately so i feel even with teachers today we've got not just great books we've got teachers available online um, me of course i'm a student of buddhist philosophy so i will recommend um, you know for example his holiness has written a wonderful book called beyond religion 
and I feel there is an explanation of the theory and then there's a very simple way of bringing it into practice um, or a book called How to See Yourself as You Really Are. You know, it's a small chapter, like two, three pages, and then you have a couple of meditation questions or contemplation questions at the end. So I feel um, the way to bring it into practice is first is just building that conviction that, yeah, that there is something I'm bringing in. Um, and the second is saying, can I uh, find a way to make that a part of my day in the smallest way possible? Because some of the methods which otherwise we put into practice, I feel are not necessarily helpful. So for instance, um, let's say journaling, right? Um, journaling is something which has become a very popular mode of self-therapy, so to speak, or just self-help or a space of venting. But I'm not completely convinced it's helpful all the time. Uh, in the sense that if, I, if I've got a certain way of thinking, for instance, uh, when I'm writing, I'm actually, my logic is going to be the same one. Um, and in my writing, and let's say I write every day, I'm actually also perhaps reinforcing uh, patterns of how I see myself or how I see the world. And perhaps those patterns need to be questioned. But in this space, not only is it not getting questions questioned, it's actually getting reinforced. So I feel sometimes uh, we need to be very mindful of what is it that we are doing and is it actually helping us question how we see the world, how we interpret the world and what kind of reactions which have actually behavioral habits and patterns that we've set up for ourselves. So if we get to see that, then it's probably a good space. But otherwise... But so you mentioned first thing was conviction. Mm. Uh, and then you mentioned traditions there are various traditions Obviously, okay. you come from a buddhist tradition there are different ones uh, most of us who are living in this professional world really don't have any time for us okay. uh, so and uh, in fact the the most recommended activity is journaling which everybody says just I mean, whatever you do just do it five minutes in the morning five minutes in the night which as i gather doesn't have your vote of confidence you know, for mm-hmm. everyone is there anything that we can do? Of course. Of course. So, I mean, I, I will refer you to my teachers because I feel um, there's been a lot of, I feel whatever I've gained today is actually just a small section of um, their kindness. And I still feel because of my own background and training, I'm 100% sure I'm adulterating it in some way, right? So um, I wish people would go and access the real thing much, much more. Um, what I feel definitely can be done is figure out a time of day that really works for you. It could be five minutes in the morning. It could be five minutes in the evening. It could be while you're traveling, whatever works really. And in that time, is it possible to slowly cultivate a simple habit? One is to learn to also just sit. Um, I feel when we sit most of the time, if you realize your brain and mind starts throwing up a whole bunch of things that needs to be done things that need to be picked up somebody who didn't respond some email which has been hovering around in your inbox for weeks whatever else our mind has this tendency to churn things right this is all habits in the way mind works i feel the first few days weeks even if you're able to just learn to sit with the mind where we don't flow with every thought but we're able to see how the mind operates because the basic premise that buddha started was to examine for yourself you don't have to accept it as true. You have to start seeing these habits of the mind. So one simple habit is saying, can we learn to just sit and watch the mind? Um, the second possibility is, of course, there are multiple meditation methods, but I feel to start with having some guidance becomes helpful. So if you connect with any of the teachers to be able to just play something and just be able to hear it, most of us have access to either youtube or podcasts or some channels which will then be able to bring in some of this wisdom which can then shift your way of thinking and you don't even have to do this every day so let's say monday i sit for five minutes and i've heard a talk on tuesday i can just simply revisit what this talk had shared can i mull over it because one is when you're hearing a teacher say something but two is you need to contemplate and say does this really make sense to me um, and I feel that's the critical part. Most of the time we hear something, but simple passive listening is not as helpful as much as if you're able to engage with the content. And engaging with the content is really asking yourself, what did I actually hear? What does it actually mean to me? 
does this completely make sense how does how do i see this um in my own life so let's say you hear a concept like impermanence right um it's in some ways a simple enough easy enough concept to understand this podcast for example started at one point and then it's going to end at another impermanent right so or let's say the weather is changing or the light is changing as we speak impermanence but how do i bring it in to my daily life how do i see impermanence in my daily life besides wanting to drink my tea when it's at that temperature so that it doesn't cool off but in terms of let's say relationships um let's say an old relationship which is perhaps with a parent or a child or a sibling and you know we are in the middle of a fight and we say things like you're always like this and you never treat me correctly or whatever else right the always and the nevers which spill out of both our mouth as well as playing in our minds all the time is actually contrary to impermanence so while we understand the concept of impermanence to really stop and say did i bring it into my day today and if i did how did i bring it in and did i bring it in meaningfully and were there spaces where I perhaps i didn't bring it in when i should have in which case being also a little honest but also compassionately enough with oneself so that you're able to say okay you know in that fight maybe i shouldn't have said all of those things because you know there are also spaces where they are trying to change um and maybe i can bring that in tomorrow and the reason we can have the thought that i'll bring it in tomorrow is again because of impermanence right um so in some ways making sure that a lot of these um concepts keep finding their way into our daily life could be i think the best way perhaps yeah uh, just to take one step back uh, yep. the first step you mentioned was conviction mm. where does one get conviction again only in the mind right <laughs> so uh if you look at your own life um many of these patterns play out whether it's relationships whether it's friendships whether it's our overall contentment um the conviction of recognizing that there's always a self which is interacting with the world uh which is leading to the larger experience of good or bad um so just building that conviction is just being able to stop and say ah what did i do or what did i bring and not from an accusatory critical tone that most of us are unfortunately familiar with i mean at some point i remember when i started uh, introducing self talk with some of my clients and then at some point i stopped and said can you tell me how you say this to yourself you know <laughs> so even if it's a positive statement but when you're saying it to yourself it's almost like <clears throat> you're angry and you're critical and i feel that is actually not the same thing you know it can be be compassionate with ourselves because we're also trying to grow and trying to change so even when we ask this question let's say it's a dinner you're sitting down with some loved one and you're eating and somewhere the conversation's a little fraught with some tension right um maybe it goes well maybe you're able to smooth things up. maybe or not but at the end of that conversation is it possible for you to take a moment to say what else could i have done at what or what did i hear and what did that do to me you know so i feel if we are even able to shift that lens a little bit inward every couple of minutes couple of hours couple of days depending on what frequency seems suitable um i feel the conviction comes up that we actually are a large part of this good or bad life that we lead um and as that conviction builds up then we recognize that i may or may not always have control over the world uh but i can definitely try and have control over my mind so there is conviction mm-hmm. and there is observing your mind mm-hmm. and both i mean this is not necessarily a sequential process mm-hmm. observing your mind could come first and that could lead to conviction and most sure. often that is how it would probably be sure. but most of us are usually incessantly just tumbling down into our own stories right there is sure. there is no place there is no gap there is no pause for us to do either of these two things uh, sometimes a short circuit happens on its own a disaster or tragedy or like something reorients us but if that is not the case what is a short circuiting point which could 
which could probably lead me to a pause. So in some ways, you know, when you're saying um, we don't have time, <laughs> I feel we don't have time because we're so caught up in our stories. I don't feel we don't have time because we're genuinely, I don't know, saving the world every fraction of every minute of every day. Uh, most of the time there is this story which is built up in our mind, which is playing on loop in a whole range of ways and tones and so on. Um, bringing practice into your life doesn't even require anything very radical. You could be standing there brushing your teeth, which I'm hoping most of us are doing for the recommended one and a half, two minutes a day. And while you're standing there watching the water fall from your tap, can you bring some of this to mind? Can you bring impermanence to mind, for instance? Or there was no foam in your mouth, now there is foam in your mouth, right? Um, or recognizing that the way I brush my teeth may be different from the way, let's say, you brush your teeth or somebody whom you live with brushes their teeth. And I feel being able to just look at individual variations in the smallest of ways can also make a huge difference to understanding this very simple fact that we are bringing and creating so much of our world around us. Um, let's say you walk into a party, okay? or you walk into a restaurant, or you walk into a classroom, what's the first thing that you see? And in what way do you understand it? And in what way do you respond to it? Um, if you've got five friends, mostly all five of them would see slightly different versions or at least explain the same thing very differently. So I feel even just coming back into the fact that we are at any point of time not passive in our life um, is not very complex. We start seeing it, we choose our music when we're driving, we are listening to something or the other. I doubt if any of us are staying alone with our thoughts long enough. Perhaps brushing stays to one of the few times where um, you can actually stay with some of your thoughts. So I feel it doesn't need something very radical. But there is definitely, um, there should be um, some motivation to learn more. And I feel that's something which can get strengthened over a period of time. But otherwise, if the lens is turned completely outward, the challenge is that much more. Because then that means you have to control this eight something billion people to make sure that you get what you need. All the other sentient beings, whether they're bugs or animals or whatever else, because you have to get your way. And I feel that's like a near impossible proposition. Well... I mean, impossible or not, but one of the, right, the, the crucial things, or at least this is how the brand positioning of the spiritual path and meditation is now that it's a, it's an inward focused path. And then completely contrary to this is the outward focused goals. And the way we are taught is school, college, job and stuff. And then we have to achieve and achievement is not isolated. It is in reference to somebody else and I have to be above somebody else. Mm. So the question then becomes that this sort of an inward journey, how does this integrate with this outward goals which I want to achieve? It's a tough one. <laughs> I'll try and answer it. I have full faith that it's not going to go well. But <laughs> um, So if you look at the Buddha himself, right? he renunciated his palace and his family and went to seek the truth. Um, fortunately, within Buddhism, you've got multiple um, ways of approaching studies. So you have a path for monastics, you have a path for lay people, and you have something which is called the Mahayana path, which really believes that I want to become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. And uh, for many of us who are students within the Mahayana path, I feel it gives us a slightly easy way out, you know, saying that here we are in the thick of job, family, animal rescues, you name it. Um, and while we're doing all of these things, which are in some ways, you know, like you said, external goals, um, rescue cat must get better, job has deliverables. Um, what Mahayana path allows us to do is also step back and look at what is the motivation with which we approach a lot of this. And most of the time I feel if you examine why does one do anything and there is a certain amount of self-glorification 
involved saying you know but you must think i'm cool right at the end of it or i must feel validated in some way or i make this amazing post which i don't know hits share or likes or i've been a little rusty on social media so whatever those terms are um you know it should be more and more and at the end of the day if you start examining our motivation throughout the day it's really about this self that we are trying to glorify and the more we try to build up and glorify the self in some way so connecting this back with the earlier question of um suffering or experiences coming as an interaction between inner mind and outer world um the greater this need to self glorify or the stronger and more rigid and tightly that i hold this self the more difficulties i usually face because it means my agenda is that much more important and i have to push it with that much more force and i have to get so many more people to bow down for my agenda and so on and i feel it just makes things a whole lot more difficult so here when we talk about motivation it allows us to hold the motivation of bringing benefit to the other constantly um so you're making a cup of tea for your family in the morning or you're doing something else can it also be with the benefit of just saying that i want this cup of tea to really make someone else feel wonderful about themselves uh for them to be able to live the life of greatest potential for them to be able to find happiness for them to be able to ease up on their suffering so i feel if we keep holding on to motivation right uh in some ways the path also gives us a space of engaging and doing perhaps similar things i wouldn't call it the same because somehow the flavor changes um but having said that um how we do things are any which way changing as a result of time so let's say you were hosting a podcast in your 20s versus you hosting it now there will be a slight difference in how you host it as a result of your own experience as a result of whatever changes you've had as a person over the past years um so here what happens is also you're just becoming a little bit more conscious and mindful of that change and you're moving that change in the direction of what we would call as wisdom because you know you're not holding self like this fixed solid entity which needs to be glorified and taken care of at any point of time so i don't feel that outside goals need to necessarily shift too much but how we do it changes how we the amount of ego that we keep bringing in and i think we really keep bringing ego in right this false sense of self and the pride associated and somebody should not treat me badly or whatever other things we have going with it um all of those things it's a little easier to drop them it's a little easier to offer victory to others so you know when you go far to say really sorry you know i didn't mean to hurt you or i didn't mean to cause harm in some way it allows you to become a little bit more again the word would be ease in how we interact so will there be a change between outward to inward i feel the flavor perhaps changes significantly the other thing which i feel changes quite a bit is perhaps levels of contentment um how much is enough whether it is money whether it's fame whether it's followers whether it's whatever um and i feel it becomes a little bit easier to say this is okay uh which is kind of nice as well because it again creates a little bit of ease on the inside so is there um i think that sort of answers the question it does and um uh, i have a little bit more to explore on your last point yes. how much is enough but before we do that an out of syllabus question go for uh, is there a self <laughs> who is speaking with you right now So I would say yes there is a self for sure there is a self there is a you speaking with me right now but is the self how we think it exists okay so let's say something is to happen and uh, you know the way we react or respond so let's say you're driving a vehicle and somebody cuts your car can you feel at that moment there is a self which reacts right there's a self which is feeling hurt or upset or somebody speaks to you rudely or somebody i don't know dismisses you in a manner which feels inappropriate mm, we react in a manner because there's also a deeper level of understanding of self as something which is fixed which is solid and this self has a huge back story about you know my life and how it's been and 
all the rest of it. And I don't know if that view of self is always true. Um, for example, if I say a part of myself would be my body, right? Um, is this body the same body that was there a decade ago? And the answer is, I doubt it. I mean, you know, that cells have been changing even as we speak. Um, cells have died and cells have been born in my body. It's just that you and I don't have that capacity to see it. Our, um, our ability to understand it is not the same. Or, you know, we spoke, what, over a year ago? Um, we're not the same people anymore. Yet there is a sense of, must be the same, because, you know, he called himself Deepak then, he calls himself Deepak now, Deepak hi hoga, and Deepak is this fixed entity, but he's not. So uh, when we say, is there a self? Sure, there is. But is the self as something which is fixed, unchanging? Um, and I would say not really. So what happens is we think there is a self which is a constant and we impose so many values and narratives on it. And that's the self we think there is. But I feel that's inaccurate and not just inaccurate. It's going to lead to a whole bunch of problems, frankly. Fair enough. So, uh, taking a slightly next uh, stage of our questions is uh, is more on the outward side, sure. combined with your inward changes, is a question, how much is enough? Mm. And if the billionaires around the world are an example, mm. there is no enough uh, in this world. So, what makes for a happy and fulfilling life, according to you, if there is no no set number that this is enough? Uh, then how do we define a happy and fulfilling life? Full of tricky questions today, but <laughs> I'll say this. But see, I feel um, even when we use the term happy, right? Um, so the small disclaimer has to be about what do we mean by happiness? Um, it's obviously not the transient pleasure that comes from my teacher's favorite example is cheesecake. And since we all love it, we all go with the cheesecake example saying that, you know, you have experiences of pleasure through the day. But when we're looking at happiness, needless to say, we're looking at something perhaps a little bit deeper. Um, and I feel the elements are actually not very complicated. If we can have a slightly more authentic, simpler life, which allows us to say what we mean, mean what we say, where we're in some ways just in alignment with reality. So for example, let's take, now you and I have to speak today, if we have to speak today, that there will be things which allow for us to speak, right? Like having a decent internet, having sunlight, having devices which work and so on. There will also be some things which will prevent us from speaking. So, you know, like the headphones, which didn't work as well. Um, and if we are able to flow and be with that, the fact that so much of it actually works in our favor through the day, the fact that we're able to get up, that we've got our senses, that we've got so many abilities, that we've got things which work in our favor, including being able to have this. Um, if you're actually able to start seeing that, it's not complicated to create the sense of happiness and fulfillment and perhaps ease. Um, so we bring that in very, very consciously through the day. Um, then it doesn't matter so much about only what we have or that some magic number where things are enough because um, there's a certain kind of fulfillment, gratitude, abundance, which is getting cultivated on the inside. The other part I feel is uh, bringing benefit to others. You know, if we connect this with what we just spoke about, this self as a false sense of self that most of us are holding on to and our life is largely some kind of attempt at feeding this sense of self right um, and it's not leading to anything good it's not leading to anything wonderful because it means eight plus billion people have to now cater to me and my needs or whatever trillions of sentient beings have to do that um, then the reverse would also perhaps make a little bit of sense that we can start focusing on others um, and we can start doing things which are perhaps more meaningful, even if it is just to break this habit of self-cherishing that we seem to have cultivated. So I feel uh, finding meaning in the work that we're doing can be extremely helpful. So whatever is the career or profession or even our ways of interaction with the world, can all of those be spaces which allow for both inner growth 
as well as something meaningful on the outside. Um, and I feel all of that then contributes to this sense of perhaps ease or happiness. Um, and we build it because another issue which I find is in mental health, so many of my clients who come to me, there's a lot of conflict on the inside. And I feel it's easy to understand nonviolence on the outside. Um, don't hit, don't harm. But sometimes we are not even being nonviolent on the inside. So I feel being able to bring compassion, to being able to bring some amount of loving kindness to ourselves can play a huge role also in um, creating ease so that we can afford and allow ourselves to be open, to be honest with ourselves, so we can look at our motivation. We can allow ourselves to speak when we need to speak, be silent when we need to be silent and so on. And I feel then um, how we see the world, this deeper understanding of world and self uh, can just be brought into our daily interactions. You know, it doesn't have to be the separate compartment of my spirituality, one separate compartment of my whatever, life, work, money. I mean, there can be a certain ease of being, which I think makes it uh, a lot better. Yeah, no, I, I actually uh, love this definition of what is a fulfilling life. It's mm -hmm. it's an ease of being in action. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that combined with authenticity, combined with finding meaning, and there are those those things which are always well proven to bring a certain sense of well-being, which is helping others mm -hmm. or doing something for uh, quote unquote non-selfish reasons. Uh, with with that said, are there any non-negotiables for such a life? I think it's going to come back to your first question. <laughs> saying you know we live in a world where uh, the emphasis is so much on the outside uh, building this conviction that there is also something i need to do on the inside is something perhaps it's like brushing your teeth you know so <laughs> retaining uh, building conviction and keeping our motivation intact um, i feel is critical so non-negotiables for me would loosely be the word practice saying that we need to practice every day um, and practice sometimes feels like this extremely complicated oh my god you have to sit and chant and have some giant shrine and it, it doesn't have to have any of that really what you mean by practice is saying what is the habits that you're building um, and most of us are building habits and supporting our habits any which way so for example if you have a victim mindset for instance right your practice is of repeating that narrative and story to yourself uh, where now it's become a mindset it's not about being a victim at some point of time but it's now a larger story which is playing in your mind so how we think is um, a habit so can we in some ways think about how we think so literally in some ways metacognition saying can we think about how we think um, becomes something which is important so when we talk about practice, it means all of this, um, having some amount of conviction because you need that when you have mainstream, which is saying, look outside, buy the second house, buy the second car, go for the next holiday, um, whatever is the marketing ad gimmicks which are going on. But so one is cultivating that. Second is, of course, the motivation that we keep. Um, are we able to retain other cherishing as much as possible? Can we not move towards self-glorification no matter how much the old habit pulls us? Um, can we study? Because I feel, again, you know, like the journaling that we spoke about, are you thinking about things in a new way, in a way which is in greater alignment? And I feel this is where teachers and texts, um, where there's been so much of wisdom that's made available for all of us. So can we study something? Can we contemplate and make sure it makes sense to us? And can we act on it? So I feel all of this for me loosely becomes practice. And it can be the simplest thing. It can be while you're standing there brushing your teeth and you're thinking in permanence, um, or you're there at a party or a space and then you're thinking about what is it that I see? What is it that I interpret? What is it that is going to be my reaction which comes from my habits? Um, and I feel it can be really that small and that simple. Of course, that's not going to be enough over a period of time, but to start with, it's a great space to begin. And then we slowly start building up. So the non-negotiables for me would just be 
practice, however we choose to define it, but making sure that we're moving ahead on that path in some way. I mean, when we talk and I mean, talking to you and talking to other people in this in this field, it seems a no brainer that we should spend some time on the inside, right? F- figuring out who we are and then basically observing. Why then is this so unnatural to everyone? I mean, why why do we have to fight conditioning or right inclinations or instincts before we take a step and then take the gaze inwards why do you think this is happening so most things again this is again truth of buddhism saying that most things come from other things so if you're living in a world which is so outward focused right i mean i'm sure you remember when you were a kid being told to get certain grades because you know did you see how much your neighbor got or your cousin got or whatever else right um or even when we think of what is good and bad frankly this concept of relativity right uh, what is good is really based on also what is bad is your marks are your marks good are you good looking are you thin are you fat are you short are you tall all of this is a relative phenomena um and over the over the years i feel if you look at how media you look at how society has been there's been again so much of an outward focus um and it's felt and we've moved towards a whole lot more individualism right so not only um do you feel like you need to achieve but you need to be better than and the better than world is also constantly changing i mean earlier let's say three decades back you had to be better than your class but now at the click of a button you get a sense of what grade 9 or grade 10 is scoring across the world now you have to be better than all of that um so i feel we have reinforced this as a habit and as a behavior for so many years while there has been a smaller minority of all teachers or all paths which have in some way said we need to shift this so in some ways we've all contributed to this path which is outward focused but um we all over a period of time understand that's really not where deeper meaning is coming from because it gives you validation for a certain period of time let's say you do really well with something and everybody's like wow you're amazing by next week somebody else is wow you're amazing then what happens to this notion of self so i feel we've built it up over the years we've created businesses economies everything which is in support of each of us thinking of ourselves as an individual um and then trying to achieve it all and i don't think that's how it needs to be i was reading an article which connected um, the concept of ubuntu uh, where which says really you know i am because we are um with buddhist concepts of interconnectedness and saying that there's so much of truth in that um and if we are able to move towards a collective by default um this shift towards individual this shift towards external achievement all of which will slowly ease up but somewhere i think in the hype we've all forgotten some of the older wisdom and perhaps um, you know podcasts like yours will help shift that and also uh, this small minority of teachers and practitioners and this large majority of people who are running in a relative race they have always lived separate lives uh the integration has has always been something of an anomaly is this because i mean they are they are fundamentally divergent or is there something deeper which lends to the to the difficulty of integrating these two aspects of inward and outward and somehow finding this this middle path so i don't know if i'm an expert enough in this to answer but i wouldn't say um I want to say yes and no <laughs> because I can see reasons for both they feel fundamentally different but you know like what we were speaking about earlier that uh there is a way to I don't I don't feel this chase for uh achievement has always been a bad thing we have for example treatment we have antibiotics we have so much of technological advances which i don't know if it would have been possible um without this kind of chase or drive so i'm not uh so i feel but is there a balance for it 
Um, and I feel the balance is perhaps what's missing. Um, for example, now we hear about mindfulness quite a bit, even within corporate culture. But I'm not sure if that's how uh, mindfulness was meant to be. So when we only simply bring in mindfulness, saying be here in present moment, um, without any connection to ethics, without any connection to what is my behavior contributing. So integration, yes. But again, it has to be really well thought through and it really has to be based on dialogue between both groups. Um, so I'm not sure if you're aware of the Mind and Life Institute. They do a lot of dialogues between both the scientific community and the spiritual one. And I feel spaces like that, which allow perhaps to let a middle path emerge um, or even ways if we are able to because all of them are actually meant in some way philosophically for the same thing, to improve quality of life, to live lives of full potential. So in, at the root of it, I don't think these are separate worlds, but somehow the paths which they seem to have taken um, seems diametrically opposite. Um, and I feel if you have thinking individuals who are who are aware that each time we breathe or act, uh, there is an impact on the world outside. Uh, and therefore, we need to be mindful of what we not just uh, behave as, but also what we speak and put out into the world, or even our manners of thinking, because it has a way of percolating. Uh, we become more and more conscious of it, then we're able to create perhaps um, that middle path that you spoke of. Mm -hmm. And for all of that, the non-negotiable is practice, uh, as you mentioned. So if I only had, let's say, five minutes in my day, what practice would you recommend me to, to move further in this, in this journey of having a, living a fulfilling life? So one is I'd want the commitment that the five minutes stays for a long period of time. And I think it's much better than just diving and doing a deep dive over a weekend and then bailing on it completely. Um, and if you choose your five minutes in your day, whether it's morning, afternoon, evening, if you've got a quiet corner, great. Um, in that quiet corner, can you either keep a few books or play something which is by a good teacher? So books, there are multiple recommendations, like I mentioned, Beyond Religion or How to See Yourself as You Really Are. There's also a beautiful book by Mingyur Rinpoche called uh, The Joy of Living. Uh, and it really combines both neuroscience as well as meditation. There's a fabulous book by Zongsa Kense Rinpoche, which is called What Makes You Not a Buddhist. Um, so I feel being able to engage with books or teachers uh, becomes a helpful space, even if it's five minutes. So literally, it could be you're reading a few lines to a few pages, depending on your speed of reading. But... When you read a certain amount, can you stop? Can you contemplate? Does it make sense? Does it not make sense? And it's completely okay to say it doesn't make sense, in which case then one dives in deeper to say, why doesn't it not make sense? Because that's the space where you're uh, examining and comparing your reality with what is being shared. And I feel this is a critical step which we should not miss. And then once we're able to build that conviction, yeah, that this kind of makes sense, once you reach a space of it making sense to you, then how do you bring that into your life? And you could bring it in in a whole host of ways. So let's say you're a very religious person. You bring it in into your prayers that you offer. Um, let's say you're somebody who doesn't believe in praying but believes in benefiting others. It could be generosity of just time or money or material or whatever else. It could just be about saying, I'm going to become more attentive in my relationships. But whatever it is that we listen so the old Nalanda tradition speaks about three steps of study, contemplation and action. So can we continuously bring this into our life? So even if it's five minutes and you read, let's say, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you read a certain chunk and you're like, huh, on Thursday, you're like, today's five minutes. I'm just going to summarize this for me. And then Friday and Saturday, I'm going to really struggle to see how this makes sense to me. And once that happens on Sunday, say, OK, I'm going to bring it into my practice, bring it into my daily life. Right. Um, so it's almost like learning a word a day where you're then trying to bring it into your vocabulary, um, where you slowly start moving in a little bit deeper. Because initially also I feel when I read some of these books, you know, it's like the, set, the understanding I had the first time and then the understanding I had the second time and the third time. Each time it's been different. 
maybe my brain is a little slower but um this repeated reading also just helps with um you know clarifying some of the concepts missing out certain key lines that you uh went you perhaps didn't pay enough attention to the first time because i feel also where we are is what the book uh, you know when you read a book it's also so much dependent on where your mind is in that moment right because again even though it's a reading it's an activity like reading the self is so visible and so present in what you take back from it so it could be a reread and some of these are also lovely audio books so for those who are not in the habit of reading because i also understand that everyone's reading capacity has dipped significantly um so in which case you know it could be an audio book it could be something which you listen to for 5 minutes and then hit pause but when you when you come back the next day just making sure you're able to revisit some of what you heard the earlier day so it's not um just a passive space it's an active space so 5 minutes a day is lovely to begin with mhm and i think the the three prong strategy you mentioned is commit to those 5 minutes unplug yourself from the world and then examine in whichever way you feel like read listen and what was happening and and just doing those 5 minutes eventually turn into something different yes well perfect nivedita this has been really wonderful and thank you again for taking the time to do this i don't know if any story or any anything <laughs> else comes to your mind to share uh we can but... do a small dedication sure i feel like you know when we talk about motivation you know like we set motivation in the beginning of any event i feel also it's important to dedicate merit at the end of it which means that any virtue which comes up even as the course of this conversation can that be for the benefit of all sentient beings and there's four lines from shanti deva's prayer which his holiness uses in multiple teachings i'm just going to borrow those for now we sit we take a deep or stand in my case but just take a deep breath out and the what lines are for as long as the world remains for as long as sentient beings remain until then may i to remain to dispel the miseries of the world and with that thank you and with that thank you Navita it's been wonderful wonderful having you back here again thank you for taking the time take care thanks so much deepak it's been such a joy as usual and uh, may your podcast continue to flourish and i really appreciate the fact that people like you are able to not just um, spend time and energy in studying and practice but also in terms of bringing it to others in a manner which is um contemporary you know where podcast makes it accessible to so many people and i feel transit times are perhaps the best times for podcasts or just before you sleep so i feel being able to uh, make make it more relevant and accessible for people is an extremely extremely precious thing so immensely grateful for all that you're trying to do and i hope um it flourishes and brings benefit to many thank you thank you so much all right <laughs>